Hi, I'm Don from Don Drones On. Welcome to Module 1 of Don's Drone Rules. This is my proposal for a practical set of comprehensive rules, globally applicable and sensibly balanced. If you haven't already done so, I really encourage you to watch my introductory video. Otherwise, you'll quickly start to wonder what I'm talking about. There's a link up in the top corner there. Maybe that corner. No, this corner. In this module, I will be talking about drone registration and pilot certification. And yes, I'll talk about remote ID as well. Let's get into it. A quick reminder that these proposed rules are for discussion purposes only. They're not real. Please understand and follow the real regulations for your country. Drone registration and pilot certification is the first of the four modules of Don's drone rules. In this module, we'll cover registration requirements, how to be electronically conspicuous, the registration process itself, and then pilot certification and associated training. So what I'm proposing is that drones that meet any of the following criteria must be registered. Drones over 250 grams that are used primarily for commercial purposes, that's number one, and by primarily I mean over half of their flights, and by commercial purposes I mean if, it's a, if your drone or your, your operation is involving a direct transaction of, of money for service. So you're doing a real estate shot or wedding pictures, or you're doing an agricultural survey for someone or a construction site survey. I don't mean ad revenue, such as monetized YouTube channel uh, or, or anything like that. So it has, there has to be a transaction, like a contract. The second criteria for being registered is any size drone that's flying in any restricted airspace. Now, restricted airspace, I'll get into a definition of that in a later, uh, a later video, but think of it for now at least as controlled airspace. All right, so if you're flying in controlled airspace, you need to be registered. Simple one, any drone over 25 kilos has to be registered. And finally, any drone that's owned by an organization rather than an individual. So um, like, a, like a company or a government agency, a police department, things like that, those need to be registered. Now, the theme across all of these four criteria is a high degree of accountability is required. So in any of these situations, you really need to be accountable for what your drone's doing. And for that reason, I'm insisting that it be registered. And there's another fact about registration on the next slide that is going to be important. The key point here is that recreational drones do not need to be registered. Unless, of course, you fall into one of those criteria, like you're intending to do recreational droning in controlled airspace. Well, sorry, you need to be registered. All right. That's quite different than, for example, the Canadian regulations right now, where any drone between 250 grams and 25 kilos must be registered. So here's where things get a little controversial. What I'm proposing is this. If your operation is such that your drone must be registered, I'm saying it also must be electronically conspicuous, which is commonly called EC. And what I mean by that is that you have to be continuously transmitting the following information. The drone's registration number, its location, latitude, longitude, altitude, and the vector, so the direction and speed, using a standard radio protocol. Now, I'm not going to get into the technicalities of what works, what doesn't work, and all that kind of stuff, and I think that will evolve over time. I don't think it should be an internet-based protocol at this point. Probably five years from now, honestly, it'll be more sensible to do that. But my perspective is that the purpose of this kind of, of uh, radio signal is to make the drone conspicuous. It is not to try to integrate that drone into the rest of the airspace and manned aircraft and all the rest of that. Instead of integration, separation, and to, uh, to make separation easier, make the drones conspicuous whenever they are doing an operation that is requires them to be registered. Now, the other thing that I think the, the electronically conspicuous signal should do is tr transmit a special alert signal 
if the drone is not under user control. So if you lose command and control link, for example, and there may be some other circumstances where you might want to do this, but that one's certainly a key one. If the drone is no longer under user control, then it needs to transmit an alert signal. That way it will not only be conspicuous, but it will also be clear this thing's out of control. It's in a flyaway situation. Now, only regulatory and law enforcement agencies will have the database behind the registration number such that they can correlate the registration number that is being transmitted to an actual drone and consequently to its owner and potentially its pilot. And I do not think that the pilot location, in other words, the control unit location, should be transmitted. I know that some systems automatically do that. I think that's what DJI is proposing as well. But from a regulatory perspective, I do not think the pilot location needs to be transmitted. I think that actually endangers the pilot. Um, I don't think there's a justifiable reason to transmit the pilot's location which in turn would make them vulnerable. So I do not think that the, the uh, signal should be transmitting the pilot's location, only the drone. And again, only the drone's registration number, which is essentially the same as a, as a license plate. So that's my perspective, and you can see that that ties in with the FAA um, remote ID proposal in some ways. I, I think it should be much more limited, radio-based only, and definitely not transmitting the pilot location. The registration process itself should be fairly straightforward. I think it should be a one-time fee per drone, not, not a recurring fee or anything like that, just a one-time fee for each drone that you have. The drone owner must be able to authenticate themselves when they, they pay that fee by providing some sort of government-issued identification credentials, either electronically or in person. Um, things like a government ID, driver's license, or whatever. That method will vary a little bit from country to country. The method we have in Canada actually works really well. You actually authenticate yourself uh, either with a government ID or through your banking system. Very cool. If you're flying your drone uh, as a tourist, so if you're coming into another country with your drone, I believe that you should actually have to register that drone in the, uh, the country that you're going to be flying in. Um, and when you do so, you register with a, a passport number. You're going to need a passport to get into that country, so it shouldn't be too onerous to do that. Because the situations where you need to register your drone are situations of high accountability, I think that you have to be 16 years old or older in order to be eligible to register. The registration number itself should be visible on the drone, no big deal and the electronic remote identification number should be exactly that same registration number, following the basic sort of notion of, of a car license plate. If we had electronic license plates, that would be the same number being transmitted. Okay, fairly simple. Now we get to pilot certification. In my system, there would be three tiers of pilot certification, basic, advanced, and professional, and we'll get into the differences right now. So the level of pilot certification that you hold will determine what kinds of operations you're permitted. And like I said in my objectives for all of this, or the principles behind all of this, the higher the level of risk for the kind of operation, the higher the level of pilot certification that you need. So for the basic pilot certification, that's required at a minimum if you are flying a drone of 250 grams. If you're under 250 grams, you don't need a pilot certificate. Now, if all you hold is the basic, you're restricted in the following three ways. Number one, you must maintain what I call situational awareness. And this is a critical term. I'm going to get into this in more detail in module four, but think of it for now as visual line of sight. It's not exactly what I mean by situational awareness, but think of it for this moment like that. You must maintain situational awareness. Number two, you must not fly in what I call restricted areas or near manned aircraft operations. I'll get into the definition of restricted areas in the next video, module two, but for now think of it as things like controlled airspace. 
and you must stay 15 meters or about 50 feet away from bystanders. Bystanders being someone who is not directly involved in the operation. And again, I'm going to get into that in more detail in module three. And in terms of how do you attain that basic certification, there will be an online exam focusing on the regulations and the safe flying practices associated with basic pilot certification. And I emphasize the, the content of that exam, it might seem a little strange, because the current Canadian pilot certification exam, which is an online exam, multiple choice and all that, it only focuses on those things for a tiny part of the 50 questions that are involved, or sorry, 35 questions that are involved with the basic pilot exam. Um, I think that's all it should focus on. It shouldn't focus on how airfoils work or whether you get a hypoxia at 20,000 feet or 15,000 feet. It should focus on the regulations and safe flying practices required by someone doing a basic operation of the style that I describe here. Okay, let's talk about the advanced pilot certification. Why would you want an advanced certification? You need an advanced for any of the following three operations. A commercial drone operation, flying in restricted area, so again, think about that as controlled airspace, or near manned aircraft operations, or if you wish to fly closer than 15 meters or even over bystanders. All right, so any of those three things. And again, I view those three types of activities as riskier operations, and so you should require a higher level of pilot certification to be able to perform those. So you might say, why do I keep including commercial drone operations as a riskier operation? And the reason I'm saying that is that in a commercial drone operation, so if you're getting paid to do the, the drone shoot, that whatever it is that you're doing, um, you are motivated differently than if you're in a recreational situation. You may take higher risks, to get the shot done that is the boss requires or get it done on the date that is required than in a recreational situation. That's the reason I think a commercial drone operation needs to be different than a recreational one, which is how it is in the States, but it's not that way in Canada. In Canada, recreational commercial drone operations are considered completely the, completely the same. So how do you get your advanced pilot certificate? The requirements are, there's two requirements. Number one, you have to have one year, one calendar year of flying experience under the, the basic drone pilot certificate. And you have to show that you have flight logs. And we can get into the details at some point about how you would prove that and, and what how, how many flights you require and all that kind of stuff. But I'm basically saying you can't just walk in and do an advanced pilot certificate by passing an exam. And, and even passing a flight review, which is what we have to do in Canada. I think you actually have to gain real flying experience and be able to prove that. And in addition to having the flying experience, you also should have to, to pass an online exam, focusing again on the regulations and safe flying practices, but in particular, the more advanced elements, such as flying in controlled airspace and the steps that you have to do in order to be uh, granted permission to do so. Lastly, the professional pilot certification. You need this level of certification for either commercial operations with drones over 25 kilos or commercial operations for cargo or passenger drones. And I know you're probably thinking, well, if it's a cargo drone, it's gonna be over 25 kilos, but I'm, I would not be surprised if there's gonna be some cargo drones that are less than 25 kilos or 24.99 or whatever. So I, I want to make sure that both of those categories are covered off. And I also want to emphasize that these are commercial operations of drones over 25 kilos. So if you've got your ginormous uh, B-52 remote control aircraft, uh, you don't have to have the professional pilot certificate in order to fly that. So how do you get that level of certification? And I'll be honest here, I don't have a lot of detail or a lot of detailed thoughts around this, but I think you need, you should have at least again, one additional year of flying as an advanced drone pilot with flight logs. And I think there should be a, an in-person flight review, uh, a practical exam where you have to prove that you are able to operate a drone capable of doing these kinds of operations 
and you can do so safely and you know all the rules and all that kind of stuff. And in addition to those two things, an online exam focusing on, again, the kinds of advanced operations uh, or advanced elements of this kind of operation. I know that was a lot to take in. So I put together this little table to summarize my view of this, and I think it'll make it a lot more clear. So first of all, if you have no certificate at all, you can still fly drones under 250 grams. With your basic certificate, you can also fly drones up to 25 kilos, but you cannot fly um, in restricted airspace or within 15 meters of bystanders. With your advanced certification, you can still fly up to 25 kilo drones and you are now able to fly in restricted airspace or within 15 meters of bystanders under the, the restrictions that I'll, I'll talk about in subsequent videos. And if you have your professional certification, you can do all of that and you get a special hat. All right, I hope that, that summarizes it clearly. Lastly, training. Now, in every country other than Canada, as far as I'm aware, the regulatory agency naturally stepped up and provided free online training material related to whatever regulations that that country, country had. In Canada, Transport Canada provided zero training material other than a website with a few bits and bobs. Otherwise, it was read, read the legalese in the regulations until folks like me stepped in. And of course, flight schools were happy to provide it for hundreds of dollars of, uh, of uh, expense in a training class. So I think that in my world, the training material related to the rules of operating drones, not how to operate a drone, but the rules of operating the drone must be provided by the regulatory agency defining the regulations. That training material should be free, should be online, and it should cover the registration requirements, certification requirements, where it is and is not permitted to fly, the procedures for securing permission to fly in restricted areas, the regulations with regard to proximity to people, and how to use and operate whatever fly safe maps or other aids are available in that country. Now, other organizations may produce additional training material or other services related to training and can charge whatever fees they, they see fit, of course, but the government basic training material for the regulations should be free online and cover those things. There we have it. Registration and certification under Don's drone rules. I've just covered registration requirements, being electronically conspicuous, think of it as remote ID, a registration process, pilot certification levels, and training. Thanks so much for listening all the way to the end. I would love to hear your comments, like and subscribe as they always say, and stay tuned for the next module in this series, Module 2, covering airspace management. Don's Drone Rules, my proposal for a comprehensive set of practical rules globally applicable and sensibly balanced. See you in the next video.